Hello? Hmm? Alright. Test? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay, it says it's on. Testing? Hello? Testing? Okay. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Today, the topic is to review for the quiz and to talk about the quiz, to review for the quiz, to a uh, ask and answer any questions that you have concerning the quiz. Um, or concerning really anything as far as this class goes, um, you know, um, the assignment or, or whatever. So let's start out by looking at the review guide, and we'll talk a little bit about the format of the quiz, and then we'll, we'll delve into the specific material <coughs> that's going to be on it. It's always, it, it's tough writing tests in, in programming classes, first of all. Um, and I know what you're thinking, it's tough taking tests in programming classes. So, fair enough. All right. <laughs> we, all, we all have our crosses to bear. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, in many classes, I go for a project instead of a, a, a test. but. It doesn't quite seem right for this because it is tough for you to work on anything like towards until like the very end of the semester and then like you'd have a week and the project would be done, you know. So I, I kind of avoided projects in this class for that reason. And if we're not gonna have a project, we're gonna have quizzes. Um this this quiz, exam, whatever you want to call it, might be a little different than than exams that you've had either from me or other uh professors um, here. Let me, let me talk to you about what it's going to be like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you um, I'm going to give you some HTML. All right. And I'm going to ask you then to write JavaScript statements to do certain things. All right. Um, that'll be the bulk of the test. Some of the test will just be on, on basic concepts. But there will also be pieces of the, the quiz that will be um, where well, I will give you some code and you'll sort of need to, to finish up the code. Let me give you a, a for instance. I might say something like this. You know, here's your web page. Input type equals name. input type equals button, span ID equals results, one question to, to give you a sense of what a question might be like is I might give you the HTML like this, except it, it would be complete. It would be a completed web page. And I might say, what would you change about this uh, so that when the button was pressed, it would call the process form function, and the process form function would display the value of that text box in the result area. All right. So you're not writing a whole script or a whole code or something like that. You're writing 
simply a, a little snippet of code and you know you have to know that it's the on click event that would trigger it and you'd have to know uh, the syntax for setting the inner HTML of that span and so on. So the questions will be like this. Well I will give you a, a piece of HTML a JavaScript function that's sort of hollowed out, all right, and you'll supply missing pieces of it. Now, you're not going to you're not going to write like a complete algorithm to do something, all right. You're not going to do uh, computations or follow some sort of algorithm development. That I believe I'm testing via the regular assignments. Your your skill at developing algorithms to do whatever you need to do. This will really be largely about um, you know, filling in the blanks in JavaScript, knowing your JavaScript syntax and you know, uh, write a statement that will test the value of a checkbox and write checked in the results area if it was checked and write unchecked if it was not checked. Something like that. You know, just like supplying a missing statement or maybe two to some pre-written uh, HTML. All right. So that will be the bulk of it. There will also be some questions concerning concepts. All of these in my mind will be short answer test uh, questions. Short answer meaning that the concept ones will be, um, you know, two, three, four sentences, I guess, depending on how precise that you write. Um, and the coding ones will be. A few statements, a statement or two, probably for each question. All right. When you're done, again, your your code isn't going to amount to anything. It's not going to do some process. It will just be a series of exercises to indicate that you know the proper JavaScript for grabbing the value out of a dropdown and doing something with it. All right. Um, my standard disclaimer. You know, it's not my intent to be deceptive. Comma splice there. But this should be a good list on which to focus your studying. All right. Um, anything that we've covered in the class um, or in labs or in the book or anything is really fair game. But it should be obvious. I mean, the kind of stuff, you know, I'm not going to ask you about totally different stuff than we've talked about. All right? It's not my aim to be deceptive. All right? Here's sort of my description of how you'll create that. On the concepts level, XHTML, know what it is and know the differences between it and HTML. Number two is a biggie. All right? If you remember, we probably spent, I don't know, two or three, probably two or the better part of two lectures just on that. The whole client server model, how websites ask for, um, or, or how uh, a, a web browser rather, asks, makes requests to a web server for a web page, the server gets it and responds to it. So we have that whole diagram. That, that we drew about how the client and the server interact. And really then a key point of that diagram is the, 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 the value or the importance or the function of scripting both at the client end and the server end. And we've identified really what client and server scripting are each good at. All right. We said why client scripting is used, why server-side scripting is used. They, they serve different roles uh, in a way. And we talked about them and we talked about the kinds of things that you might do on one versus the other and, and what you hope to gain about doing one versus the other. So make sure you have a good understanding of that and make sure you're, you're able to give some examples of what you might do client-side versus server-side and why you would choose to do it there. You know. Um, so that single question really, oops, this single bullet point really is a biggie, all right, um, as far as the concepts go. It's, this is probably like the chief concepts uh, that will be covered uh, on the test. 
lot of the other stuff really, in a way, is almost review of CISS 216. All right, XHTML versus HTML. The benefit of separating presentation from content. What I call the client side triangle, where you have the three technologies, um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and how they each have their own role, and they each bring something to the table uh, on the client side. The rest down here sort of probably gets into the programming aspect of it. Um, Object-oriented programming, um, objects, properties, methods. Especially for this, the DOM and how to use it to access and manipulate the things on the web page. And functions. We spent uh, a fair amount of time talking about a function, talking about what makes for a good function. Um, how arguments are used, how return values are used. All this stuff is, is like fundamental stuff. You just got to know this stuff and you got to be comfortable with it in order to, to code uh, any sort of client-side coding. HTML events, those in my mind are pretty straightforward, but make sure you understand how they work. Um, make sure you understand where to put the event, for example. And make sure you have an idea of what the common events that you're likely to use are. All right. Again, you know, um, my aim isn't to give you some obscure event that we never talked about in class, but is possible to put on a checkbox or something like that. My aim is to to go for the kind of basic fundamental events that that we've talked about in all these. By the way. Um, if I did not mention it, this quiz is open notes, open book, open internet, so you can go out on the internet. My aim is though, uh, you know, my, my thought is, is that if you're learning this material for the first time on the day of the test, all right, that you won't have sufficient time to, to learn all this material and write your answers down. But for example, um, the one that, if I'm away from JavaScript for a long time, I sometimes really have to think, is it on mouse over or on mouse on? Or, or on mouse, mouse on? All right, I really have to think about that. Is it on mouse over or is it on mouse on? Uh, what is it? Um, and, you know, to go and look that up, you know, yeah, that, that's okay. You got the concept down. You understand what it's going to do, but, you know, I'm not going to penalize you for, like, blanking on some verbiage, you know, because I do stuff like that a lot. All right, JavaScript. Uh, declaring variables and alerts. Uh, we talked about alerts a little bit. Um, the implication of JavaScript being a weakly typed language. We did talk about that. Um, again, the idea of JavaScript being a weakly typed language is that unlike other languages, variables don't have set in stone data types. You know, in other languages, if you make something a date, it's always going to be a date. In JavaScript, it sort of figures out what it is based on how you're using it and the value of data in it. For example, if you have two numbers and you add them together, it will do the numeric addition. If you have two strings and add them together, it will do a concatenation. So it sort of figures it out. And that's not always a good thing, because if it's guessing at what values mean, it's liable to guess wrong, all right? And it's liable to interpret it wrong. All right, loops. We've done some for loops in this class. If statements, we've done some if statements in this class. Scope of variables. We talked a bit about the scope of a variable. That is, a variable that is used, or declared rather, in one function isn't necessarily available in another function. Here's a biggie. The equal versus the double equal, when to use each. One of the most common errors in JavaScript that, that I see people, people make. Referring to form fields, uh, we did spend a fair amount of time talking about this, so this would be sort of an important thing. You know, how can I tell if a checkbox is checked? How could I tell which radio button out of a set of radio buttons is checked? 
What is the value of a drop down? What is the value of a text box? All these things are the kinds of things I would expect you to be able to do. To be able to point to something uh, on, the, on the page and do something based on it. So if it's checked, do one thing. If it's not checked, do something else. Creating functions, again we talked about creating functions and the purpose of arguments and the purpose of return values. It's funny, A, 10, and 11, and maybe even 12, are virtually saying the same thing, all right? Uh, I didn't even notice that, but um, if you want to give me credit for being clever here, I said the same thing three ways because that's just very important. All right. The whole point of client-side code, of client-side JavaScript, is to change the page some way without reloading the page completely. And changing the page is often based on values that you get in a form. Uh, in our Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation, we change the page based on our calculations, based on the value of a text box. Um, in other cases, we've changed other things about the page. We've made things visible, we've hid things, we've outputted HTML. We've done a lot of different things, all right, based on the value in form fields or based on other factors. But in doing that, how do we do that? Well, our JavaScript code first must point to the thing on the page we want to change and then be able to change the relevant attributes. Thirteen, triggering functions with events. You know, how I can make it so if I click on a box it do, or a button, it does something. Doing math and string operations. Again, nothing crazy, but you should know how to concatenate a string together. You should know how to do addition, subtraction, multiplication in terms of math. And uh, a bit about arrays. Again, we didn't, uh, I don't know if in, we had too many examples about arrays, but those should be covered in the book. And we did uh, talk a bit about arrays when we were referring to radio buttons. And essentially a radio button group is really an array of radio buttons. And we can loop through and iterate through that loop and look at the values and, and determine which one is checked. That is it in a nutshell. Um, I suppose you have two hours for this. And it's open book and open notes. So we'll go directly to lab on Wednesday. And you have two hours for it. And open book, open notes. Um, any questions about this? No, not really. Okay. The difference between XHTML and HTML is it, it XHTML is the language HTML rendered following the rules of XML. And, and, what does, and what that means is that means that every tag needs to have an ending tag. Um, every tag name must be lowercase. Every attribute name must be lowercase. Um, every attribute value has to be in quotes. Those, I, off the top of my head, are the main differences between that. Probably more important than that is the rationale for, our, for XHTML. Although, again, you know, things move in a lot of directions at the same time. If we were to have this class a year from now, we might be talking about HTML5 instead of XHTML. 
but regardless. The rationale between XHTML is um, computers like things that are rigidly defined. Um, in standard HTML, the fact that you should have, or the fact that you can have tags without an ending tag isn't good. That's amb ambiguous, all right? And therefore, the, the advantage that XHTML has over HTML is it closes those loopholes. And as far as having ending tags for break tags, that's largely a moot point because you shouldn't be using break tags anyhow. <laughs> yeah. for, for tag names and for attribute names. So for example, if we were, and, and again, the, the interesting thing is, is that's the way I code anyhow. So, you know, even like in 2.16 when we bring this up, it isn't that big of an adjustment. But in HTML, this is legal. In XHTML, you would need both the tag names and the attribute names to be lowercase. So that's that's the two things that would need to be. Plus a lot of other things, correct. But what we were talking, well, the question was asked about the case, and that's what the case would be, the, the tag name and the attribute name. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, I, I've kind of skirted that issue, and I guess I'm not going to be obsessed about that. What you can do is actually the ampersand LT would be, a uh, semicolon would be a less than sign, ampersand GT would be a greater than sign. So, uh, GT semicolon. Um, I'm not going to sweat that on the, on the JavaScript. Um, you know, if you move it to an external file, then, you know. Yeah, I, I, yeah it's, it's actually an LT. Remember, the, the way I remember, less than, greater than. All right. There may be a problem, by the way, related to that, concerning how to enter any HTML code that you have to for the quiz. I'm talking with distance learning to see the best workaround for that. We may have you do something like instead of using the less than or greater than sign, use an asterisk to indicate your tags. All right, I hope that doesn't throw anyone's game off. In other words, instead of doing this, oops, do that. All right. Simply because when you introduce that code, when I go to grade it, it thinks it's HTML code, and I don't see what you've written in. All right, and it makes it a pain to go back and review it, and so on. So I'm talking to distance learning to see if there's a way we can reconcile that. Um, don't do anything until I specify how how you should handle that. All right, because if there's another workaround, we'll do that. I'd prefer not to do something goofy like that. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Other questions? Yes. It'll be online. Um, it, it'll be online. Um, I, I think that's best for everyone. Um, you can use paper to you know, if you're like trying to think of what to do, you know, by all means, you know, you can sketch out your answer on a sheet of paper before you, you enter it in. But I think for grading and for all that, it, it works out better. There's relatively few disadvantages to doing it online. Other questions? Now, next week, so a week from today, we're going to start discussing PHP. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we're done with JavaScript. We will come back and we will revisit JavaScript, uh, but we're going to add PHP to our mix. A good thing to do this weekend, 
after you've taken the quiz, or even before the quiz, you know, but I imagine before the quiz, you know, if you're going to devote time to this class, it's going to be getting ready for the quiz. But after the quiz, a good thing to do would be to install PHP on your home machine. One thing I have noticed students mention is that this works very neatly. All right. This looks very works very neatly. WAMP, EXAMP, and MAMP. Um, WAMP stands for Windows, Apache. MySQL and PHP. So it's a nice little package, nice little development platform where you, you go through an install and you really install all of them. All right. Uh, you, it, it starts up a little, little mini uh, web server on your machine and you have a little control panel for it. And this typically works pretty well for students, I've found. Um, quick Google, you should be able to find it. I didn't supply a link um, to it, but you know, I'm sure you can, you can find where to do it. I have given other uh, information uh, about this. Uh, no, you don't have to do this. If you do all your um, development on the machines here on campus in the, the business division lab, then they should be configured to work already and you don't have to do uh, all of this. Um, but you do need to have web server software installed and you do need to have PHP installed. Now. Uh, many students don't have web server software installed. If anything, many students have Visual Studio, which sort of has a little development web server built within it, but that's not really a true web server. That will only work for uh, you debugging your, your .NET code. So you might want to install um, Apache instead, um, or, or along with, probably is a better way to put it. So if you don't have uh, web server software installed, if you don't have IIS installed, uh, a complete version of IIS installed, which is Microsoft's uh, internet um, web server, you might uh, want to look at uh, one of the Apache things. It is good to, um, again, get a, a sense. Uh, Apache is probably the most uh, common, most popular web server software in the world. All right? It is one of the great open source success stories. All right, because it is a, a complete open source application, and yet it is, you know, the probably Apache and its variations is probably the world's most most common um, web server. Par All servers. Pardon me. All servers have I don't know if I would say that, but I would say it's the most common. All right. Other questions, comments. All right, what we'll do is we'll get the lab. You can have an extra half hour bonus lab or you can cut out a half hour early or whatever you'd like. All right, we'll see you over in lab.